Well, hi, and welcome again to Doing It Right. And you know what it's about, to inspire, engage, and just equip you more to be the leader that you're born to be. Because all the guests I have on the show are just that, leaders who lead authentically from the heart. And I can't wait for you to hear the two guests I have today. And it starts with the question, do you think there could have been humans on Mars? Stay tuned. We're going to find out. Welcome to our podcast, Doing It Right. This podcast reveals authentic stories from successful leaders doing it right. It's about their journey to become a leader, their choices, motivations, and lessons. In essence, how they built successful personal brands. Your host is Valerie Sokolowski, author of eight leadership books and nationally known as an authority on executive presence and personal branding. Let's get started. Here's Valerie. All right. I am so excited to welcome two guests today. First of all, let me introduce Becca Sosland Siegfried, NASA's system engineer for the robot Perseverance, affectionately known as Percy. <laughs> And she also was the mission's operation engineer. It's her job to maintain its health and well-being. And by the way, as I listen to a lot of the broadcasts about the little robots that are up there on Mars, they referred to them as a she, her, instead of an it. So that was even more endearing. So welcome, Becca. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And right next to you is your proud dad, Steve Sosland, the Vice Chancellor at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center. And Steve's been a guest on my show before. He's known for his work all across the country developing values-driven cultures. He's the best. And oh, is that so needed in our chaotic world today. So welcome, Steve. Thank you, Valerie. It's great to be with you again, and especially today. So. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you both are just beaming. I know it's good to be together. And I'm going to start, if it's all right, with Becca. Becca, tell us, with that fascinating uh, degree that you have, how did it all start? So I grew up in a small town, Fredericksburg, Texas, if anyone's ever heard of it. Um, and it just so happens that in this small town, there's a special class at, at the high school here. Um, it's called, or it was called Principles of Technology. They've since renamed the class. But what we did is learn about physics through building rockets. And that's where the love of my uh, fascination with space started. And when I was in eighth grade, so prior to taking those classes, I saw these two twin robots land on Mars, Spirit and Opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that first sparked my interest in space, seeing Spirit and Opportunity land. And then when I got in high school, I took the Principles of Technology rocket class where we built pretty big rockets. They were 22 feet long, approximately. That's how long ours was that we built. And then we launched them out at White Sands Missile Range. Um, so they were capable of going 100,000 feet, which is the edge of space in NASA terms. Um, and, and I loved the engineering side of space. So I decided to get my degree in aerospace engineering. I went to the University of Texas at Austin, um, where I had a few internships and then ended up landing at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And really because... I wanted to help find life on other planets. And the Jet Propulsion Lab is the best place you could possibly work if you want to help find life on other planets. Um, and so I started working on the very rover that I saw in eighth grade land on Mars, Opportunity, and spent some time uh, working on Opportunity for a few years. And now I work on Perseverance, the great granddaughter of Opportunity. And she is almost two years old on Mars. Uh, she'll be two in, on February 18th. Oh, that's just, that's just out of this world, informational and fascinating. So, so many questions, Becca. Let me start with Opportunity. I think they called her Opie. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Oppie. Oppie. Okay. Oppie, obviously, for opportunity. Well, so tell us about the movie that came from that. 
Yeah, so um, there were several different partners involved with making this movie called Goodnight Oppie. Um, there, there's a company, well, our director, Ryan White, um, and Tripod Media actually partnered with Steven Spielberg's company, Anne Boleyn. If you've heard of Anne Boleyn, they did yeah. E.T. Mm -hmm. um, and also Industrial Light and Magic, who did the animations for Star Wars. George Lucas's company. That's right, George uh, Lucas's company. Yeah. Um, so they partnered together to create this incredible documentary about these two rovers, these two robots roving the planet, um, and really focused on opportunity. She was only designed to last 90 days. Both Spear and Opportunity were only designed to last 90 days, and Opportunity last almost 15 years on Mars. So the story, this documentary, is about not only the rovers and their mission, but the people who operated them mm -hmm. and how... Um, the rovers really become part of our family. Um, it, it's an, it's really an incredible story, and it's a it's the first time that I've seen this perspective on what we do at NASA. So I think it's a really important story to tell, and it'll inspire generations. So let's stay on that little um, robot for a moment. First of all, she looked she just became real. And uh, as I watched the movie, and you can see at the bottom of the screen where you can watch it, it's on Amazon Prime, I believe. Isn't that right, Becca? Right. I was fascinated with so many things. And what I loved about it was not only watching Opportunity, but also just everything behind the scenes that went into that. And I'm just curious, what kind of a person does it take to work at NASA? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I would say, Valerie, that it actually takes a lot of different kinds of people that we need working at NASA. Yeah. I think the diversity of um, opinions and diversity of backgrounds is really important for what we do. Um, we actually, on our rovers, we incorporate instruments from all over the world. So we have at least on Perseverance, we have instruments from Spain and France and Norway um, hmm. and other places all around the world. And depending on people's backgrounds, they bring something new to the to the world or to our rovers and how mm -hmm. we engineer them and perform the science on them. So I think it takes a lot of different uh, perspectives. But I think what we all have in common amongst all of us is this fascination with asking questions. Mm. Where did we come from? How did we get here? How, what was Mars like thousands of years ago? What was it like billions of years ago? How did it change? All those questions and being inquisitive is probably the common thread between all of us on the team. And you know, that was, Becca, one of your teachable points of view, one of your leadership lessons. You, you said it's important to have the diversity of a team. Uh, with all the different perspectives and personalities, what were the what were the personalities like of the people that you've been working with all this time now? Yeah, I, <laughs> they're some of my favorite. The team that I work on are some of my favorite people. You know, they they say they imagine people working at NASA typically. If you probably ask kids back when I was in high school, uh -huh. um, that they're you know old white men um, who are pretty <laughs> nerdy. Um, that is actually not what you'll see when you go to JPL. There's a lot of different diverse diverse people, diverse backgrounds. Um, but I think the type of person is is um, someone who isn't afraid to um, question the the leadership, mm -hmm. isn't afraid to if if they don't feel like something is quite right, um, or we might have missed a step, or or something like that, that they mm -hmm. they will question it and speak up. Um, that's been a lesson actually we've learned back from the Columbia disaster when yeah. the space shuttle Columbia uh, blew up. Mm. We have been really trained amongst uh, amongst the engineers and the scientists at NASA to speak up if we ever uh, see a problem. So I think you'll actually find that we have a lot more um, nerdy people, of course, because we all <laughs> we all love nerdy people. But they they. Uh, 
also are a lot more communicative maybe and uh, conversationalist and ask questions and um, than one might have imagined, I guess. <laughs> I love that. Nerdy. I don't think so. I don't see anything nerdy about you. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big nerd and I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You go, girl. <laughs> Steve, well, what are three words that you would use to describe this wonderful daughter of yours? Oh, uh, thanks for asking that. <clears throat> First, to tie into what Becca said is curious. Uh -huh. She's always been curious from a little girl at age two asking why. And we thought that was just because she was two. Uh -huh. um, actually, she has never stopped asking why. Mm -hmm. Or, and she doesn't, you know, uh, she is the daughter who has never let me get away with anything without a thorough explanation of, of uh, why something is the way it is or why can't it be better. And so her curiosity, her wondering of the world has served her well in her career, but it's served her very well as a mother, as a social activist, as uh, just a great human being, great wife, uh, and obviously as uh, I'm a, I am a proud dad. But if uh, if there was one characteristic that I think really nails Rebecca, it's it's her curiosity. So that's one. Uh, the other is uh, just an incredible heart. She is emotionally intelligent, well beyond uh, what. Um, her experience would say if you looked at her eight years of ex almost nine almost eight? ten wow nine okay. and a half years of experience <laughs> at the jet propulsion lab she leads uh, a team of 91 people she has with a couple of others that but together they lead a team of 91 um, and these are all really smart people so it requires a high level of emotional intelligence uh, and becca will lead with her heart first and I think it served you very well, uh, sometimes frustrating because things get emotional, um, but uh, it, it it's great. So she has curiosity. She has incredible heart and emotional intelligence, and she balances it with uh, humor. Uh, uh, I don't know how I would phrase it. Humorous intellect. <laughs> Beck is really smart, but... She has this self-effacing way about uh, about the way she does it. She combines all of that. So if she's in a room and something doesn't make sense to her, uh, rather than attack somebody for their idea, she'll just ask a question and she'll do it with some degree of humor and a bit of self-effacing when she does it. Like maybe, you know, I'm not sure that that I really understand this. Could you maybe explain why? And she'll do it in a way that disarms someone so that they can um, uh, come to, uh, as their authentic self, be okay with the way she questions. Thanks. And she does that in, in just a really nice way. That's beautiful. We should record that. <laughs> we just did. <laughs> Ask him these questions more often. <laughs> Becca, um, your dad has been so instrumental in your life. And knowing him as I do with the work he does with uh, creating value-based cultures, and that's, of course, dear to my heart because I'm all about trying to create authentic leaders. When you were so young, eight, eight years old, was it? Uh, I read on your story about you were fascinated by the stars and your dad saw that. She recognized, he recognized that. I think that's such an important point to bring up because when parents are attuned to their kids and they noticed attributes and, and skills and mindsets and attitudes that can be developed then, early on, then they become the best human beings that they can be. So what would you say that you remember growing up in the family, the Soslin family, that has served you well in business today? That's a great question, Valerie. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't the easiest child. Um, I was pretty rebellious growing up, which I think probably has served me well in some instances of my career. Um, but my dad would always ask me, like if I if I had a question for him, he would always say, 
okay, do you want me to be your dad right now, your coach or your mentor? <laughs> and, you know, a part of that was learning the definitions between a coach, a mentor and a dad, but, uh, and having to answer which one I needed, but he always um, tailored, he asked a lot of questions, which I think was really important for me as a, as a kid. Um, he asked, you know, how did I want him and my mom to, um, you know, I'm thinking of an example, so I'll just say it. I, there was a time where like, I didn't really want to turn my homework in on time just to like be rebellious, I guess. Um, and there was a time when they were really on to me about it. And you have to turn your homework in on time. You have to do this. You have, and then there was one point where my dad just stepped back and he goes, you know what, how do you want to be parented? How do you want, and just asking me how, what would work best for me to as a learner, you know, or as a, um, as a kid was and respecting that and treating me like an adult was I think really important growing up and something that my dad was really good at, um, was asking a lot of questions, um, which then made me answer them. You know, I had to really think about what I needed and wanted and, um, and my learning style and stuff. So there were little things that I don't think I appreciated until later on in my life that I still apply to my kids now and apply honestly to the people on my team. So I think he started training me in values-based culture and leadership um, even when I was eight years old. <laughs> okay. Back, I got to give you the backstory to the example on the homework though, mm -hmm. because that really came from Kelly. Mm. And um, Kelly asked me as Becca's mom and uh, I'm Kelly's husband, and she said, how much longer do you want to be the one that's the driving force for Becca doing her homework? Mm -hmm. And at what point are we going to allow her to uh, be able to fail forward? That was that was Kelly. Yeah, you're right, Dad. Yeah, was. and uh, it was eighth grade. Yeah, and, she, and Kelly said she's got one more year before this really counts for what for what college she may want to go to. So it was a very conscious decision. I may have delivered the message, but it was the driving force was Kelly. Yeah, so uh, you may want to ask about why women, uh, why are the rovers named after women? I think you'll find that the greatest leaders are women. <laughs> oh, dad. <laughs> All about that. Thank you. <laughs> we can have a whole segment. No, but you know, speaking of that, uh, have you ever had any, because women have asked me to ask, leaders like you, Becca, have you ever had any um, issues with being a woman, especially as an engineer, especially with all the, all the publicity that you've been getting, yada, yada, yada? Yes, very much so. Um, I can think of a few examples um, where me being a woman has uh, been hard in, in this engineering world. When I was in college, I wasn't doing very well in uh, in one of my classes. It was the hardest class. It was spacecraft dynamics. And you have to think about, um, there's no up or down in space. Everything is relative to something else. And so you're almost like all the things you've ever known in your life, as far as um, physics goes, you're finally taking these classes where now you're in outer space and everything's different and you have to like retrain your brain. So I was struggling in this class and the professor pulled me aside and I, I went into his office hours and he pulled me aside and asked me if, are, am I sure that I want to do aerospace engineering? It's not made for everybody. There are other degrees I can do. I could be a teacher. And he started like really trying to push me to get out of engineering and out of aerospace engineering and do something more appropriate for me, um, like teaching or other things. And he even said like, you know, I'll have kids one day and this degree might just be a waste of time for me because I'll probably want to stay home with my kids. And, and anyway, I ended up doing a lot better in that class after that conversation just to like show him. And, um, I actually think I ended up pulling out a B plus in that class maybe. Um, anyway, but there was another time in, in my career at JPL where I got some advice about, um, try not having kids yet, delaying having kids until much later in my life so I could establish myself as a leader because, or establish myself period as an engineer, um, because, you know, being a mom is, takes away from 
that it's just a fact. It just takes away from you being a really good leader, which I didn't take that advice. I actually ended up having kids probably pretty young compared to my, uh, to other people in my, at JPL. But I ended up finding that motherhood actually made me a better leader. And it made me understand people a lot more clearly. And I had a lot more patience for people, I think, on my team. I think I was a better listener. Anyway, I think motherhood actually has trained me really well for leadership. And Valerie, she had a great role model at JPL, who's actually in Good Night Oppie, the movie mm -hmm. as well, and highlighted early on. And without giving away any of the movie, there's a during the middle of the movie, as you saw, there's a generational shift as one generation of engineers hands off uh, the rovers to the next generation. And so someone who was a leader, and I think a mother of four, mm -hmm. Yeah, a mother of four was a great role model, sounding board, yes, uh, and mentor of uh, of Becca's, and he helped her uh, to be able to take on that responsibility and to have patience uh, with those of my gender who may not have uh, as much understanding of of just how strong women leaders are. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So Becca, I'm I'm picturing you at JPL. For those of us who don't know a lot about what it looks like, what's a typical day of going to work, working on robots that you're going to send to Mars? Yeah. Descri describe the campus. Okay. Because I think that, I, th I think a lot of people uh, may, especially hearing the name Jet Propulsion Laboratory, might have their own preconceived notion of what the space looks like. Yeah, that's a good point, Dad. Um, so the, the JPL is this incredible campus that's kind of tucked away in the foothills of the mountains in Pasadena, California, and it's a gorgeous campus. And because it's in Los Angeles, the weather's pretty perfect all year round. So, you know, driving into work, I'm already trying to flip from living on Earth time to living on Mars time as I'm driving into work. Um, I'm trying to like put myself, you know, on Mars because that's a very important part of my job. Um, so I walk into Mission Control. So for those of you who've seen Mission Control, it's also in the movie, you know, it's a dark room. And where we do most of our development of the rover's activities and analyzing its data is actually a floor upstairs from the dark room where we actually send the commands. So I go upstairs on top of where the dark room is and I sit down at my my computer and the first thing that I do is look back at what we planned yesterday. Okay, so the there are two teams. There's yeah, there's really two main teams that are responsible for developing the rover's activities in a given day. We speak to the rover once a day hmm. and she's back to us about four times a day. And the reason for that is the the size, the file size, the, what we end up sending to her, her instructions are pretty small. You know, sending instructions like a recipe to somebody is like a pretty small set of things. But what the rover does with those instructions, like makes movies and videos or yeah, videos and pictures, those are really, really big files. And so we need those four opportunities for her to speak to us to get all the data down from her. So I will sit down at my computer, I'll review what we planned for her to do the day before. And then I sit and wait and it's always time to when the data is about to come down. So one of those four passes um, is about to hit the ground. So I'm sitting at my desk waiting for the data to hit the, the ground. And then um, I announce to the team data's arriving and we start analyzing it. And we have about an hour to analyze all the data that's coming down from the rover. And it doesn't take that long for that data to hit the ground. And we have incredible ground processing tools where we take that data, turn it into meaningful information in about five or 10 minutes, um, which is pretty cra crazy and mm. incredible. And we analyze all that data. And like I said, it's, it's now information. So we look at the information and it takes a human to actually, uh, some things can't be automated yet. Um, like looking at an image and knowing where the good science is can't really be automated yet because 
we don't actually know what to automate. We don't, we've never been in this place before. Anytime we drive to a new location on Mars, it's like an entirely new mission. We don't know what's behind the corner, what's behind the rock. So it takes us a while to look at these images and decide what we want to do that day. And that's, that's really the main part of one side of the team, which is the downlink team. That's what we call it. The downlink team is analyzing that information and deciding what we want to do that day. Then we hand the baton over to the uplink team. That's the mm -hmm. other team. And both of these teams comprise of about half engineers and half scientists. The engineers make sure that we keep the rover healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. And the scientists are always pushing the boundary. They're always asking for way too much. <laughs> and the engineers have to reel them back in and say, uh, 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 nope, you cannot drive way down into that ditch to go look at the cool rock. But what we can do is do this, and we give them other alternatives. So we keep the rover healthy and safe. The scientists always push the boundaries. Um, and so the uplink team is responsible for whatever the science, the dreams that they have that day, we make their dreams come true. And that's when we like write all the sequences for the rover. But there are many teams that are writing parts of the sequence, and they all have to come together in this like perfect recipe. And then we take that, we run it through a simulation to make sure the rover is going to do what we want it to do, and then we bundle it up and send it up into space. And that takes about eight to nine hours. Oh, my gosh. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to comprehend, really. And the rover took how long to even get there? Yeah, so the rover takes about nine months to get to Mars on the the trajectory that we have. If we sent humans, it would take a bit longer because they, they can't inject into the, there are space reasons why it would take longer for a human to get there. But the trajectories that we're on with our rovers are anywhere from like six and a half to eight and a half months, depending on the where the where how the planets are aligned. You know, I, Becca, I want everybody to that's watching or listening to really appreciate what goes into space exploration. So Becca, do you think there were humans on Mars? Mm -hmm. I, I don't think there were humans on Mars, um, but was there life like microbial life or um, unintelligent life once on Mars? Potentially. Um, it, it's, it's possible and that's that's exactly what we're trying to answer now with with perseverance that's its biggest mission is to um, collect samples martian samples dig down put them in tubes and we deposit the tubes in fact we're doing it right now hmm. on mars we're depositing these tubes on mars for mars sample return our next rover to come collect them and send them back home because we really need those samples back on earth to to determine if life had ever existed on Mars. Um, so, so it's a really important step, which, which is gonna be really exciting. Those sample tubes will come back in about eight to 10 years. And when we get them, that is going to unlock a lot of answers that, of our questions that we've had for generations. And Valerie, I wanna interject something if I may, mm. uh, that I think applies broadly. And that is that when, they designed the mission uh, for Perseverance to be able to get these core samples and, and then drill, put encase them, set them aside for Mars sample return at a future date. JPL didn't have the technology to actually pick up those samples and bring them back. Mm. That's not the first time in our history of space exploration that that happened in 1961 when John F. Kennedy spoke to Congress and set a visionary goal that by the end of this decade, we would send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth. We didn't have the technology. We didn't even have the metals that could withstand the heat of reentry. And so he did what visionary leaders do, and that is create a vision uh, and be able to state it clearly of what it is that we want to do in the future that we cannot yet do. Yeah. Isn't that what you work on with authentic leadership? <laughs> Absolutely. Always pushing the envelope of what we can do better and grow from and learn from. 
What a fascinating story today. Becca, five years from now, well, you've worked on Perseverance five years, right? So I guess I should push it out more. Ten years from now, what will you be doing? Um, hopefully I'll be working on Mars sample return. Um, so if you remember, Valerie, my, my dream as a little kid was to help find life on other planets. Right. And if I'm working on Mars sample return and we get those samples down and analyze them and maybe determine that life could have existed or did exist on Mars. That will be like the capstone, you know, having kids is one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. Um, and, you know, answering this question will be the next. So that's going to be a huge thing for me. And I hope I'll be a part of it. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm grinning from ear to ear because there are so many philosophies and discussions about is there life, meaning some kind of a human life. And so there's all this discussion about spaceships and proof that they, one of them landed, I understand, and something was captured and it's underground somewhere secret. <laughs> what do you think? I just want to know, what do you think? Um... Yeah, you're about like the science fiction part of what we do. Are there really spaceships out there that have human-like things that come and visit us? Yeah, I mean, I <laughs> I don't know, Valerie, but I think it would be really cool if that was true. And I love that we at JPL are trying to make science fiction science fact. Yeah, um, I love it's, that. You know, back when my dad was a kid, um, there were video, and he could talk about this, there were videos, I'm sure, you know, what, what science fiction did you see growing up that maybe has become science fact now? Oh, I think there's so many things, uh, even for those who are Trekkie fans, yeah. you know, you can see the communicators that they had. And, yeah. <laughs> Right. And uh, so many other things. Um, like the laptop, maybe like the iPads and the. Moving. Sure. Touch screen, touch screen technology. Yeah. And, uh, moving things around. Yeah. Little things. So we, I have no idea what's going to, you know, it, it's fun to think about, right? It's fun to think about um, all the cool things we see on in movies and TV. And, you know, I just watched Avatar and, thinking about like, ooh, could aliens really look like that on other planets? <laughs> what we do know is that we have a lot of uh, planets in the habitable zone around stars. So these planets are not too hot, not too cold, but just right. They're in this part where like they could contain life. But that's life as we know it. That's mm -hmm. Earth life. Mm -hmm. There's no telling, you know, we could have, there could be methane-based life. There could be other kinds of life out there that could exist in like really, 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 really cold conditions or really, really, really hot conditions. Um, and, and there's a lot left to discover in the universe. There's so many more questions that we have that can get answered. I have no doubt that, you know, if we look at the technology and how it's changed in the last 50 years, last 100 years, it's gone up exponentially and it's going to continue to do so, especially with the generations coming up and um, all the the technology that's coming out today. Um, so I have no doubt that we're going to start uncovering those kinds of answers to those questions. So exciting. And we will stay tuned. And I just wish you, Becca, in your career continued major successes and surprises. Wouldn't it be cool if some robot got up there and you found something that no one would have ever thought. Okay, I want to, before we go, and I wish we had three hours, but we don't, I, I want to ask a couple of questions. There was a man on the show named DeWitt Jones who, um, you can look him up. He was on the show. Go back and scroll, those of you who are listening, DeWitt Jones. And he said, quote, always put yourself in the place of greatest potential. Let me say that again. Always put yourself in the place of greatest potential. So I want to know how close you were able to put perseverance 
in mm-hmm. the right place with the right potential so that she could do her job? Excellent wow, question. what a great and appropriate question. Yeah. So, great. Okay, so we, for the first time on Perseverance, we put this new technology on board called Terrain Relative Navigation, TRN for short. And we used to only be able to land in a huge, so with Spirit and Opportunity, like in Goodnight Oppie, um, we had a huge landing ellipse where anywhere in this landing ellipse, uh, Spirit or Opportunity could have landed. Mm -hmm. And we had to, the rovers don't drive that fast. So then we'd have to drive to the location that we wanted. We know now over the last decade or two that if we can make that landing ellipse small or really, really as small as possible, then we have a greater chance of meeting our science objectives sooner. Mm. So we created this terrain relative navigation with all the diverse opinions we had out there. We, we had this huge problem to solve and we didn't know how to solve it. So we asked a ton of questions to everyone and we knew to like try and come up with this new technology. And what it does is it's it as the um, hovercraft is coming through the atmosphere, it has cameras underneath it and it's taking pictures of the ground and it has this processing on board that's trying to pick out a landing location that's the safest possible for the vehicle. And the little hovercraft, once the back shell flies away and it's on its own and it has these propel like this, these little jets, it actually maneuvers the sky crane in a place where it's safest for the vehicle. And it has allowed, the, the little jets has allowed us to um, land in a landing ellipse that's very small. Mm. And man, it's running away with me right now, like the size of that landing ellipse, but it's small, sm- the smallest we've ever had. Um, and we are actually almost like right on where we it, with perseverance, we've landed in a location that like is very science rich. Right when we land, right where we landed, high potential. High potential. <laughs> now with spirit and opportunity, we got super lucky with opportunity. We literally landed like a hole in one, um, which was luck. It wasn't getting us to our potential on purpose. It was just luck. But with perseverance that yes, we are able to like really land where we want to. That is just amazing. Again, that word amazing. I'll have to find another word. When when they are done and they close their little eyes and they go to sleep, <laughs> are they just left up there or what happens to them? How, how many do we have up there? Sojourner was the shape of a microwave, um, and she's still up there. She was our very first rover and landed with Pathfinder, which was a lander. Um, So we have Pathfinder and Sojourner both still up there. Then we had Spirit and Opportunity, which are both, all four of them have since passed away. And they are just, their eyes are shut, and they're literally just getting buried under the sand on Mars. Um, and then we have Curiosity, who's still doing incredible science and has been up there for about 10 years, 10 plus years. Um, she's doing great and is still roving and alive. And Perseverance. So we have six. Wow. And we actually have a lot more. We have Landers, too. Insight Lander, which we just announced passed away just a week or two ago. Um, and there's been a lot of other Landers. And we have Orbiters, Landers, Rovers. But those are just to name a few. And Becca, one final question. Are we the only ones that have landed anything up on Mars? What's our competition? (laughs) We do have competition. Um, We are the only ones who've landed a rover safely on Mars, but we do have other, we do have other space partners, European Space Agency, China's also land, trying to land something on Mars soon. But yes, there are other um, parts of the world that are trying to land stuff on Mars as well. But we are the ones who have had the most success. And we might be able to get a human up there? Yes, that is the plan. We wow. are already, it's already in the works to try and uh, get humans to Mars. And we have 
technology demonstrations on perseverance and we did on curiosity too to help us prepare for humans to really understand the environment that they're landing in um, and, and to understand how we're going to get them there so that is already in the works trying to get humans to mars safely and back home just a fascinating time together with daughter and dad and where you can uh, reach these two people or information about them is on the banner underneath. And Steve, I know you for one are always happy to take calls or questions about your work. Becca, don't know about you, but underneath is the right place that my audience can go to learn more from these two wonderful people. Becca, anything else that you'd like to say before we go? Um, the only thing I'd love to say is if there are any young people listening out there or any parents of young people listening out there, um, if you are interested in space, then reach for the stars. You can do it. If I did it, you can do it too. Um, and, and really anything that you want to do in your life, you can achieve. You just have to um, have a work hard and ask a lot of questions and don't be afraid to ask for help. And find those opportunities. And Steve, what about you? Anything you'd like to say? Oh, I think it's just been a, a great honor for us to, you brought us together today. So this was really terrific, Valerie. Thank you for that. Um, I think that nurturing our kids' ambitions mm -hmm. and allowing them, and not putting uh, boundaries on that and mm -hmm. allowing them to go where they would want to go uh, and try the things they want to try. Um, I've certainly learned because I've helped so many um, who have decided to switch careers later. That's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, everything in our path. It only makes sense when we're at our age looking back. Yeah. We can see how that thread of continuity makes so much sense. So nurture our kids all along their path. And I think they will find uh, what's meaningful for them. Thanks for the opportunity. You bet. Wise advice and blessings to both of you. Until next time, bye for now. Thanks for listening. To receive Valerie's Voice, free monthly leadership tips, and to learn more about her leadership programs and coaching, visit her website, ValerieAndCompany.com. Next week, we'll be here again to inspire, engage, and equip you with teachable points of view from successful leaders who have been doing it right. Until then, lead authentically.